starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Can you hear me? Hello? I did not hear the introduction from your side, and I, I'm not sure if I... People can see my screen. I think you can hear me all, but I have to get a confirmation. Could you call my mobile phone and tell me that everybody can hear me? Okay, so it's working. You could hear me now? And we have people. Yes, thank you. Okay, welcome everybody from around the globe. My name is Morgan Svons and uh, I will give you a presentation of our cooler system. Uh, basically, I would say uh, to start with that, um, of course, it is uh, a different way to do a presentation where I don't have eye contact with all you guys and where you have uh, no chance to um, uh, come with questions online. So I don't have the possibility to give you uh, to get your feedback if I am explaining too fast or too slowly or something is not logical. Uh, so it's it's a challenge, uh, and I will do it uh, very uh, slowly. And then, of course, you are welcome uh, to take your notes and listen to it again. I guess it will be uh, available for you guys. And then you can send me an email for any technical uh, or any questions like uh, I didn't catch what you explained on, on that slide or could you go deeper into that or whatever. Because my main uh, task, uh, target is uh, that uh, through a common understanding we can get to the same platform of uh, the importance of uh, our equipment. Um, yeah. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, I have worked more than, yeah, more than 30 years in the cement industry. Uh, developed uh, different coolers like uh, push bar coolers. Um, I was the project manager for those development and are on many patents. In 1999, um, I was the first one to take a walking floor or shuttle floor uh, into a patent application, as I said, in 1999. A uh, walking floor uh, principle to transport the clinker or shuttle floor to transport the clinker, it is the same thing, uh, has been used uh, before that year in other industries like how to empty a truck and so on. But uh, I took it into the, to the clinker coolers. Let's see how we get to the next slide. Yes, and here you can see on this slide that any question you can send to this info at fontstechnology.com. 
I think I have already told you that I have worked uh, with with R&D uh, for many years and developed uh, uh, the clinker cooler CSS walking floor principle for clinker coolers was invented by me in 1999. So we are the first movers in this. But uh, so let us first. Uh, I didn't hear the presentation from our headquarters here. Uh, my 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 uh, my speaker was not working, but I guess it was said that uh, we have uh, we have to be more and more conscious about our CO2 from fossil energy uh, that we burn, and uh, something like seven percent of the world fossil released CO2 is actually burned in cement plants. So we are a huge uh, contributor for this CO2 balance. Um, and basically, we can, we, can, uh, we can lower the fuel consumption in the PIDO system by having the right cooler. Uh, but let us first look at the PIDO process here in general. What we have here, we have a preheater with so and so many stages, maybe also a calciner. And the preheater function is also a heat exchanger because we come in with our raw meal here symbolized as one. And then we exchange with some gases here as an explanation at 503 degree. And they quite immediately become the same temperature. And then we have a cyclone where we where we separate the raw material and the gases come out at this 316. So that's a loss. And the 316 raw meal now comes down to this state and get this temperature, 665. And again, the, it immediately heat exchange and reach this cyclone to come and come to an even hotter a gas. So you can say that this is a heat exchanger and the more stages we have of cyclones and the better the separation efficiency is, the less temperature we come out with up here and that is a loss. At the same time, we also have a heat exchanger as our clinker cooler. In this example here, uh, we have some of the air. You can say that the clinker cooler has two purposes. We, we inject a certain, uh, a certain volume of air, uh, something like 1.8 normal cubic meter per kilo clinker, throughout the cooler. This is to get an acceptable temperature of clinker leaving the cooler. Normally we have 65 plus ambient, so let's say that this is in a hot area, maybe it could be India with uh, 35 degrees. So we will have clinker coming out at 65 plus the 35, totally becoming the 100. But in our cooler, not all this 1.8 normal cubic meter goes back to the kiln. It depends on how much um, fuel consumption we have. So somewhere in our cooler, we have a zero point, we call it. This is like a virtual line where, where I have my mouth now. To the left from that mouse, we are having the air going through the clinker layer in this region. And this, is, this air is heat exchanging with the very hot clinker coming from the kiln and becoming hot and going back to the calciner and back up to the secondary air. And somewhere where we have this line zero point, the zero point of the cooler, uh, the energy in the clinker uh, to the right of that point is actually a loss, uh, looking from the pyro point of view. Of course, we could have some uh, waste heat recovery, but from the pyro process, whatever temperature is left in the clinker at that zero point will be a loss from the pyro point of view. It can either come out as some hot gases, the vent air or waste heat recovery, or some energy in the clinker. 
So if we first have this baseline right, that we have a heat exchanger at the clinker end, and we have a heat exchanger at the at the at, at the preheater, and those two are actually influencing each other in the total consumption of your pyro process. Because let's say that we have a very poor preheater, or we can also say that we have maybe only two stages. Then this pyro process with the exact same cooler will have a very high, uh, would have a high, um, uh, the, the, the pyro process will have a high fuel consumption. So it needs a lot of air coming from the, uh, coming here from the cooler. So with a very poor preheater, this 1.8 normal cubic meter, a lot of that air is going back because we have a poor heat exchange efficiency at the, at the, at the preheater. So then there's not a whole much of loss because the zero point will then move here to the tail end of the cooler, right? Because we, let's say that we use uh, uh, out of these five uh, flow errors here, we use four of them. So only the loss will be very little. But the cooler was exactly the same. So that means that a clinker cooler is, the efficiency of a clinker cooler is fully linked with the rest of the pyro process. You can have the exact same coolers giving you a, a different efficiency, right? Because if you have a poor preheater, the efficient, the same, the cooler, the exact same cooler will have a better efficiency with a poor preheater and with a very good preheater it becomes more difficult uh, to have a good heat exchange efficiency of the cooler now let's let's try to understand the heat exchange efficiency of the cooler please use the um I don't know if I should go to this mode here. So to get on the same platform uh, of a heat exchanger efficiency, I will try to go through some steps. Let us try to picturize only for our understanding that we are having one liter of water or one kilo of water. And let's say that this one kilo of water is having a temperature, it's boiling, it's 100 degree. We just took it off the stove. And in this step here, let's say that we have, we are, we are bubbling from below air, but we are only bubbling 10% uh, of the one kilo, like 0 0.1 kilo of air through. Let's say that these bubble are very uh, fine and they have a long retention time going through this uh, 800 or one meter water depth, right? So if, they, if we have a heat exchange efficiency of 75, that means that the air will reach not 100 degree, but 75% of the 100 degree. So it will reach 75 degree because we here defined the heat exchange factor as 75. What is now the water temperature? In this calculation, we keep it simple. So we're saying that the, the, the heat capacity in water and air are the same only for our understanding. So that means that we, if this air reads 75% and it was only 10%, remember, of the water, so the energy that this water came from zero to 75, that energy amount from zero to 75, 10% of that has to be subtracted from the water energy, right? To make the equation right, to make the thermal balance of this first step correctly. So that means that the air now will be 100 minus 10% of the 75, which is the 
If we get this right as the first step of the cooler, because in our cooler, our clinker is moving from the inlet end and through the cooler, and air is coming from the bottom and going through the clinker layer. So step by step, we can now go to the next slide and understand. So th this part here, the left part was what you saw before, a heat exchange efficiency of 75 would bring this one to 75 degree of that difference from zero to 100, and the energy was now 95. Now, I put all these cells out here to the right, like each time we put another 0 0.1 kilo of air, and another 0 0.1 kilo of air, and another 0 0.1. So you can see the next one is not coming up with 75 degree of the air, because now it's entering 92, right? Because the water was pre-cooled or cooled first stage. So if we calculate 75% from zero degree, zero degree to now water temperature of 92, after the water leaves cell number two here, the water is 85.6. And the next step of air bubbling through is not reaching 75. It is by the same calculation reaching only 69. So you can see that the water temperature is going down step by step by step by step. And the air temperature leaving that one area of the cooler is also coming down. Let's say that we have a zero point in this thinking process. Uh, let's say that we use uh, we we'll use all this air to cool the water or the clinker, uh, whatever we want to look at it. But let's say that somewhere we only use one uh, kilo of air. So that means that this is the energy left in the water or in the clinker, right? So we could say that, oh, the remaining we used from 100 down to 45. So that makes a cooler efficiency of 100 minus this number. That makes a cooler efficiency for this one as 54. Because the 45 was left, we started with 100. So we utilized from 100 down to 45, which is the 64%. Let's, let's just try to look at the same example now here, where we say, if we focus on another a more bad heat exchange factor. Let's say that the bubble became much bigger. So they, they bubble in big sizes through the water. This will make the retention time of the, of the air going through the water shorter. And since the bubble are bigger, they cannot take the same amount of heat from the, from the water because they, don't, they only have a, a certain surface and the volume is bigger inside a, a bigger bubble, right? The area of a bubble goes by the uh, radius in the power of the two and the volume of a bubble goes in the power of three. So of course, bigger bubble will not, they will pass through fast and they will not, ex they will not get the same jump in temperature. They will not go to 75, maybe, Let's try in this example to say we have a heat exchange effect of 55. So that means that the air, the first step of air will bubble through, but will only reach 55% of the step from zero to 100. So it will only become 55. Now, also the water in after this first step will only be reduced in temperature of 10% of the 55, so it will become 94. Instead of up here, we have 92. So that means if we go through again all these steps, that now the, the water temperature is coming more slowly down. And if we go to the same point of, let's say one normal cube, one kilo of air, now here, the temperature of the water on the clinker is 65. So that means that the efficiency is 100 mean, sorry, uh, 56 or 57. So the 
So the efficiency of this cooler is 100 minus the 57, so 43. So the bottom one here is a more poor cooler because we didn't have the right control uh, of a long and right retention time. And that brings a, a, a lower cooler efficiency. So how do we get, now you have a certain, I hope, I would have loved to see your faces and maybe being on a whiteboard where you could come up and, and please explain that again. But let's say we have this as a base now. So for to create a good heat exchange efficiency, we, he, we need to have the right controlled airflow through our clinker. We cannot have one area in the cooler where a lot of air is passing through very easily and another area where no air is passing through. And please remember that air is lazy. I normally, as a joke, say it is like most people. It takes the path of less resistant. So, so our challenge in the clinker cooler is that our clinker layer, whatever the kiln comes with, uh, we have to deal with. Some area of the cooler maybe have a uh, finer clinker, you know, when the kiln is discharging clinker, it is discharging into the cooler and it is actually by nature bringing a coarse side and a fine side into the cooler. And the coarser side of the cooler is uh, with a lot of void between the bigger clinker. And if we don't do anything like all all other suppliers, many of the other suppliers, uh, they only have a passive resistance in the great plates. If we have a lot of void between the side of the cooler with big clinker, then a lot of air will go there. And at the other side where we have maybe more dusty clinker that packs well together, it is not so easy for the air to go because the air takes the easy pass. And then we have not the good heat exchange efficiency because we need once again to have the same amount of air to each great plate disregarding air, any change of airflow resistance in the above clinker layer. Hereby I mean if there is an easy pass somewhere in the cooler we cannot accept, uh, we have to react to that one, we have to add some resistance uh, before in our great plate or before the great plate so that the airflow will not be bigger when there is an easy way for the air to go. So uh, just this slide is actually one where you can get uh, a good knowledge about cooler in a way because many people come and ask us, oh, what is your cooler efficiency? And this is actually an irrelevant um, uh, question, or it needs more information to answer correctly. Because like I said in one of the first slides, here I just tried to say if we have only two, if we put the same cooler, that means the same total airflow in these two examples. Let's say that we have a poor preheater, maybe we have a fuel consumption of 922. That fuel consumption needs a certain amount of oxygen to burn that fuel. And to burn that fuel, it is something like one normal cubic meter. So somewhere in our cooler, we have the zero point here. The bottom one shows a heat, a very good uh, many states uh, preheater. Maybe we can come to 738, a lower fuel consumption than the 922. With that lower fuel consumption, also the requirement from the cooler is less. Here I write 0 0.8 normal cubic meter. Up here I write one normal cubic meter. So you can see that the zero point is more to the left here. That also means that, of course, remember I said before, the energy in the clinker at the zero point, this is our loss. 
And since the cool, since the clinker come in at a very high temperature and it drops going through the cooler, of course the clinker temperature is lower here where the zero point is more to the right. And the clinker temperature is hotter at that point here, more to the left. Actually, I have calculated that here it will be 65 kilocalories per kilo clinker. And down here, since we are more to the left, it's 93. If we say, what is the cooler efficiency in that example here? The, kil the clinker comes in at something like 383. So the efficiency is 383 because this is the energy coming into the cooler minus the loss divided by, divided by what comes in. So this has an efficiency of 83% this cooler, the top one. The bottom one, I use the same clinker coming in 300, 383. But now we subtract 92 because we were up here where they were more hot. So this cooler has an efficiency of 76, right? And it was exactly the same cooler. So to ask us as a cooler supplier, what is your cooler efficiency cannot be answered unless we look into your whole pyro system. Because as you see here, same cooler, different efficiencies. So always when we put a, um, when we want to go into dialogue with you, we send a questionnaire to find out what is your present situation. And then we can, by your filled out questionnaire, we can come with what is uh, the possible saving, the potential saving, if we change the cooler, right? Here again, I try to picturize two different uh, scenarios. Let's say, let's say that we have very good equal uh, airflow. Then it will have a, I always say that there is a transition zone and actually the clinker, of course the clinker in one layer, if this is one meter, we start to cool at the bottom. And if we do this right, then we have an orange, I call it the transition zone, where the air goes from uh, the temperature at the undergrade compartment, and then it, trend, it, it is uh, transferring uh, temperature to the clinker temperature. And once it has the clinker temperature, it just goes through the hot clinker and nothing more happens. Then next step, the clinker moves one step to the right, and that means that this cooled wedge, the gray area. Uh, now now that, that height in the gray area moves more to the right. So the first part there is just going through the gray and then it starts to heat exchange. And everybody can understand here that when the air exit this red zone, if the zero point was here and the air exit, all this air is very hot, right? So that means that our temperature going back to the kiln and, and, uh, and the preheater is higher. So this is a good cooler, the top one, if we have a cross-sectional thermal view of the clinker. Down at the bottom, maybe we have a left and right, one side of the cooler where the air is going very fast through. So then it becomes more uh, like this one where the transition is actually not controlled. And now we have cooler air coming in that orange zone to the left of this zero point, and hereby our cooler efficiency is not so good. So how we do this is uh, we need to fill out the questionnaire, as I said, and then we have to do a planned audit. Uh, to make very sure because, and that will be done together with you, because this will be the baseline for also verify, verifying guarantees. So first thing is to find out what is the present uh, operation. I mean, we use the questionnaire to come with a body quotation, and then you can, in your organization, try to see, is this something we want to take one step further? And then we will do a planned audit together where we will try to evaluate, uh, we will make sure that we are both together. How do we take the temperatures? How do we ensure the fuel consumption? What is calibrated, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then the base point, uh, this will be used for our later guarantees. Again, we will together measure clinker temperature, airflow temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So after we have done this plant evaluation, we will do a strategy for what to change. Maybe, maybe also you want to do something uh, of the kiln seal because we can see there's a lot of leakage. So it comes together with a budget for a cooler. Maybe we have to do some uh, modification of the top cyclones because they are not uh, ready for that. And please remember that once we put in a better cooler, we will actually get a better, uh, a much higher secondary and tertiary temperature. So that means that we don't burn so much fuel, right? That means we have to lower the ID fan. That means actually that your pyro process has room for increased production. Right? So a better cooler, at first stage you need to lower the ID fan to reach the same production. So that gives you room for more production. So all this, we go into a dialogue, say, do you wish to have even more production? Then maybe we have to look at your cyclones and so on. And then we'll come with the price and the contract. And then we will execute the job, uh, change cooler and whatever we have agreed as add-ons to become, to reach the goal that is in the contract for the saving and the production. And then we will together evaluate that we reach the contractual guarantees. I don't know if you can hear me with this one going. So basically, uh, basically we are doing uh, the planned audit together. This is, this is where you can see our simulations and in this project here, NUC, we changed uh, three double cyclones, so six cyclones in the preheater. And we uh, modified uh, the kiln hood and the feeding system and the vent fan. We removed one dust cyclone that was here in the, in the church area. And this was actually a very, uh, you see the plant is here connected uh, near the sea and we have the mountains behind and actually you can also see there is a highway. So it was a very uh, compact uh, plant and there was two lines next to each other can be seen here. And one of the lines were, uh, the other lines was in operation while we did this modification. And uh, here step by step. Yeah, here the cooler, and this was uh, a new search here, doc. In this case here, we put a new casing, and then uh, since our cooler has no fall through of clinker, we don't need any under conveying system here. Here you can see our uh, units coming in, they are pre-assembled in our workshop. So the erection is actually very efficient and fast. Yeah. And then fire up. In this situation here, so here was the a production before of 2,800 and by a cooler and the seals and the cyclones, uh, we guarantee that we can jump to 3,200 and we achieve two, three, sorry, before it was 2,800, we guaranteed 3,200 and we achieved 3,400. They had a very high fuel consumption. We guaranteed that they will drop to this, 790. And in fact, they, they jumped to 750. And like I said before, with the clinker temperature, 65 plus ambient, they had 190 before, and they we even get got even lower clinker temperature, uh, 55 plus ambient. Also, 
also the electric consumption, uh, because with a more efficient cooler and the flow regulation of the uh, through the uh, rate plates, I will come back to that. And the ID fan using less, uh, then we could guarantee them a saving of five from 31 to 26, and we came to a saving of two more down to uh, 24. Yeah. Let's go like this. Okay. Um, so, how do we do this? Uh, we, we have a flow regulator for every grade plate inside, um, inside the uh, cooler. Our grade plates are 400 by 400 millimeter. Below that grade plate is this flow regulator. And we call it the staff because we can step the airflow through each grade plate by moving this plate down here, back and forth. Maybe I should actually, uh, uh, I think I will, I think I will open this one to show you our flow regulator um, in the 3D world and to explain in details before we see an animation how it works. Let me see if I can open it. Yes. So the flow regulator, um, the flow regulator is working with no electricity and no chromatic. Uh, it is just the simple laws of uh, mother nature so each of our great plague like i said is having this device uh, underneath And I don't know why it's not opening up. Something is okay. Here we are. So we have we have a flap uh, inside the regulator, and this flap this flap can move back and forth. So like this, and this flap, here we have a spring. So normally this flap, uh, the spring will push it into a fully uh, a position like that. So the air can go through the open area from, now we are looking from the bottom if we were under the cooler. So the air can go through this area. And once, and I'll come back to why why this flap automatically adjusts. You can see when it becomes into a more and more close position, the area for the air to go through is getting less and less. So this is how it adjusts the flow. Not no, it adjusts the opening to keep a constant flow. And the other thing is that we can actually we can doing commissioning. We will set this plate, and if I put up to uh, there's a number here. We can open this, uh, loosen this screw, and put this one into any position and tighten it again. So now, this is a constant regulator, but we can change the constant by repositioning this one and making the area 
to be activated upon more, less or more. So this one, since we can step this one, we call it the step airflow function. Let's see if I can come back to this. Yeah. Nah, the computer is jumping a little bit. So we call it the stepped airflow function. If we take the S, T, A, F, and F and put it together, it becomes the staff. This is, of course, a play with word. That we have now an employee for every great plate giving us optimal heat recuperation. So let's say that we have a high clinker resistance. I talked earlier about small, uh, dusty clinker, very compact. Then there will be a high delta P. Remember that we have a certain compartment pressure down here. Then there will be a high delta P over the, over the clinker. And then automatically, we will have a low delta P over the regulator. And it will be fully open because that that delta P over the regulator is actually the one that is over this flap, and it will automatically swing into a more and more closed position. If we have lower clinker resistance, we start to have some, we call it staff resistance, because now this flap will get activated. And remember that the area for the air to go away. And if we have very, if there's a very easy pass in the cooler for, through the clinker, the, the flow regulator will activate very much. So we have a constant flow regulator. And we can actually move that plate like you saw before in the SOLIDWORKS. So we can adjust the airflow. So here you have the same regulator. And if we are on the pink one, we have we have closed pretty much that circular plate below. And if we are up here, we are having a higher flow. So with no spare parts, we can actually adjust the flow to every grade plate. There are other suppliers that has uh, mechanic flow regulators, but if you have to have another flow, you have to change the regulator. But in a case, we don't need any spare parts. We can just go in doing our double door, and then we can make sure that we get the flow to every great plate that we wish, and we do that during commissioning. Also up at the fixed inlet, we are having the flow regulators to ensure the airflow to every great plate. And since our great plates are also tilted a little bit downwards, we can make sure that the clinker is sliding. We call it isokinetic. That means that there's no dead zone that means we don't give uh, any place for giving birth to a snowman. We only have air blasters up here at the very front wall because here maybe sticky material can sit, but we have no blasting system in the great plate. It is not required if you know your mathematic and physics and have this uh, patented device. We can ensure that no snowman is built up on the uh, fixed inlet. We have also in our grade plates further down, grade plates are no more a wear item because we have a dead pocket of clinker. Uh, here's something here. I think I have to jump out again, sorry, to activate this one from another source. Sorry, now it looks like it looks like my my computer is locked. Uh, no, I cannot move my mouth now. I don't know if this is because I'm through this uh, webinar that it has locked, or because something is pending. No, now something happened. 
No. Um, to be frankly, I don't know how to release it. It is absolutely locked. I cannot even move my mouse. I think I have to uh, disconnect and come up again. Sorry for that. Keep you waiting for 30 seconds, one minute. Hello everybody, this is Mikna from CW. Mr. Fons is just uh, restarting his uh, presentation, so it will, uh, it will take a couple of minutes and we will be back. Thank you for your patience. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, sorry for that. Um, um, what I wanted to continue with was to show uh, the flow regulator in operation by this animation. I hope it will open here. Normally it's not a problem. Show my screen, yes. One, two, three. I hope everybody is back and can hear me again. Sorry for that. And still I'm not sure if... Why this cannot... Normally I can you open this animation. We can see you. Okay, I got an SMS from head office that now thinks you can see my screen. And now I'll see if I can start this animation. No, I don't know why I cannot. 
let's try to take another one. Uh, I know this animation is uh, also, let's see if this works here. So, sorry for that delay. I hope you had time to uh, uh, fill your coffee cups again. So let's say here we have the regulator and let's say we have a compartment pressure down here. The air has to go through the regulator into the grate plate and then meet, we have a dead layer of clinker and then finally comes our hot clinker in the walking floor. So if there is no clinker up here, then we'll have to have a high delta P over here and it will swing in and give a small opening. So more air will not come even though we have, uh, even though we have a, an easy pass in the clinker, the regulator will automatically compensate with a resistance so that we will not get a whole lot of air going through a very cold zone. And once the clinker is uh, in the full resistance, uh, like shown in this animation here, then you can see that now the regulator is quite open. So it's not adding any resistance. So this is a constant flow regulator. That means disregarding before when we started the animation, we had no clinker. So if we have zero, a very low pressure loss, not a whole lot of air will go. And if we have the right resistance in the clinker layer, the flow regulator staff will be open and uh, not adding any resistance. But the main thing is that we can now, many competitors, they have to have a high pressure loss in their group. Lower this in the great place because our staff, our flow regulator, is ensuring that no air is not taking an easy pass. See here again, for some reason, of course, this is exaggerated, but let's say that our kiln is discharging uh, less cooler or they are more coarser or something where they start to have an even easy pass for the air. Then the staff will automatically take reaction and close more and more to add resistance so that the flow is constant. You are welcome to write an email if there's something that is not clear uh, of this, or if you would like to have this animation uh, for you to uh, understand more deeply. So we will go back to the presentation. And I think also our time is okay. We were here. And of course, in the great plate itself, uh, in, not up at the, uh, we have, there's a labyrinth for the air to go, so there's no fall through of air to our undergrade compartment. Here you see the walking floor. Uh, so they will go, this is the fixed inlet, and you can see the air blasters only up here at the front wall, nothing else. Here you can see the regulator, we have cut through to show the regulator and the grate plates and then there is a seal between the lanes. So we will have a dead pocket of clinker between the two vertical plates here. That means that, that great plate is no more a wear item. And here we sum some of the things uh, that we have. Uh, high uh, efficiency and we can, with our lanes, we can make it uh, the number of lanes in the cooler 
each of our lanes have the width of 400 millimeter. So we can use, normally we can use the existing pacing to go into and find out how many lanes can fit in. And we have a modular design. So that means that, that our uh, models will be a sample like that with our very special bearing system, the four joint mechanism. And then once we erect it, we can do it very fast. We have changed a 10,000 ton per day cooler in Nali in East Turkey in 21 day plus seven day for refractory. This was actually together with a kiln hood and new casing and roller crusher. Our, our record, I think, was a 4,000 in 14 days. So we can use the yearly stoppage to uh, bring in your yearly stoppage so we don't add any downtime by changing the cooler into your plant. Here was the seven years old push pack cooler in Nali, Turkey that we changed. And we have many references from Japan to Peru uh, up to this 15,000. And I want to show you uh, one more before we stop. Uh, one movie just to see, uh, because I talk about walking floor. And I want to show you uh, one from our workshop. We assemble everything in our own uh, workshop and I would uh, like to show you before we ship so walking floor is basically a system where where all lanes are moving forward together. And here is a small model you can see with six lanes. Six lanes go forward together and then they go back in sequence. So one and four is going back, two and five, three and six, and then they all six go forward. But this is walking floor invented by us in clinker coolers in 1999. Many others are following this principle because it has a lot of advantages. And if you look here, look the clinker up here where my mouth is, is not carried back on the return stroke, but going forward on the forward stroke, right? So with this principle, we can go horizontal. So red rivers are also less because a river needs a slope to be able to run. So this is in our workshop with an eight lane cooler before we ship it, we hook up with the hydraulic, our PLC, and test that the sequence and everything is all right. And then those units that you saw before are very easy to uh, install because it's all tested. Here you get one small view of our very special bearing system, the four joint mechanism, which is another brilliant solution to create a straight line motion using points of rotations. Uh, some people, some suppliers use uh, rail guides that are dust sensitive, but here we have created points of rotations that can be sealed. And we have a central greasing system to supply grease to each bearing, uh, each bearing every week. We give a little bit of grease to each one of these bearings. So this is how to create a very robust linear motion so we can have a beautiful steel between the lanes. Here you see it from below with the greasing. And here you can see the staff mounted, right? For every great plate. Okay. I guess I have utilized uh, my time by now. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to uh, receive some of your questions or questionnaires so that we can work together to reduce the CO2. Normally I say that we have to use, uh, it's our responsibility, you as a supplier of cement and me as a supplier of machinery to make cement that we can do this in a most 
environmental friendly way. We need the cement, but it should be done correctly. So please let us help each other to uh, make the world less CO2, uh, with, with less CO2 burden. Thank you. I don't know if the headquarter wants to take over and say thank you, uh, but other else I am done from here. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for attending our webinar. We will also be sharing the presentation and recording in a, in a couple of days. And also, uh, please, uh, please contact Mr. Fons directly for any questions you might have about the, the technology he presented. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Okay.